The branding theme of the Datsusara thing is people who create their own path. The term itself, the Datsusara story, the term Datsusara is referred, is a Japanese term that refers to abandoning corporate life. What an awesome word. It's basically becoming a ronin, you know, like the masterless samurai who sort of goes off. And that's, so the, I mean, it's as cool as it gets, the concept itself. I was about to say Mavericks, but Sarah Palin fucked up that word forever, so we can't ever use it again. But we can say awesome bags. Yeah, that's the other thing that makes, makes it easy to be sponsored by him, is that we don't have to lie. You know, the stuff is amazing. The bags, computer bags, backpacks, everything. All handmade, which if you are a sensitive soul and you are into sustainable things and not just enjoying fucking up the planet, no pesticide, very sustainable crop. At the same time, if there was a UFC of hemp versus cotton, hemp would kick cotton sass any day. Well, probably even easy to do cotton sass. Come on, what's that? But in any case, it's like... Good one four times stronger than cotton is like nature kick-ass fiber so that's very good one of the things that's nice about the bags is that antimicrobial so microbes germs fungus all kind of crap especially if you go to the gym or you use bags in that type of environment it's shady what you can pick up now with these ones because hemp act against it and essentially you know pick up, the way i picture it is and i swear i had no drugs in my body as i was imagining this but i picture that if you have some atomic microscope and you put it on the datsusara bag what you would see are micro minuscule little hemp warriors kind of like a whole army of the chinese terracotta soldiers but they're all made of hemp and they are like a one zillion of a millimeter big and they are just the second microbes hit the back, they start kicking royal ass and they, you know, they let out their best imitation of a Bruce Lee Kiai before they attack <laughs> and kill all the microbes coming in. So, I mean, that's a Sarah bag. Microbes never stood a chance. <laughs> and welcome to Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty.com and the Conscious Resistance.com. So today we have Daniele Balelli. Uh, he's a um, history professor at Cal State in Long Beach and Santa Monica College. He's coming in from California. And uh, what initially caught my eye was his History on Fire podcast.com. Uh, and also, he has his general page, uh, DanieleBolelli.com, and also his Facebook page on the same name, Daniele Bolelli, and his personal profile uh, by the same name, keeping it consistent, <laughs> um, at, and, and on Twitter, at D. Uh And so we'll talk a little bit about his History on Fire podcast, because that's what really got me uh, interested in his work. And he's, he's written a few books, and his most recent one is called Not Afraid, and it's on Amazon. And also, you can get the audio version of the book uh, at his website, daniellebolelli.com. So, uh, Daniele, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Of course, man. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about you, um, you know, through Prof. CJ when he interviewed you. And, nice. Uh, and I really felt uh, a connection with you because, you know, first of all, you know, interest in history and philosophy and then, you know, Taoism and martial arts. I'm like, God, how... <laughs> How much right. similar am I to this guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really, uh, I really felt, uh, I really felt a connection there. But uh, so yeah, can um, can you just go into I guess uh, a little bit of uh, you know how you got into Taoism and uh, and martial arts and and history? I guess your love of history. Before I think um, history. I don't know. Since when I was a kid, kind of like when I started learning how to read, I had all these books that were about ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, ancient whatever the hell, and they were, you know, a lot of images, but also a lot of um, uh, a lot of text. So I was learning a little bit that way. But then I could get kind of like my fantasy run wild, looking at the images and imagine what what it would be like and and I dug it. To me it was like always an adventure. There was always a story. It was always some kind of cool and I never really seen history as anything other than that. It has always been to me this uh 
exciting, interesting thing that I would play with. It wasn't like some subject that I had to learn in school. So to me, that's where the whole thing is comes from. You know, it's both I find it wildly entertaining and at the same time very interesting because you learn a lot about life through it. But the two elements were never really that far apart, the entertainment from the deeper kind of lessons you can get from it. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's very unfortunate when you have that interest in history and learning about the past and then you go to a uh, you know history class in government school and that that curiosity is just beaten out of you <laughs> yeah, <they are laughs> mercilessly not, yeah they are really poorly done they um uh, this is the kind of thing on the other end that like to me when um like i i rather have a kid who plays assassin creed all day long and i think they are going to be more likely to be interested in history through playing Assassin's Creed than anything that they ever learn in junior high. Mm -hmm. um, I think because that one kind of brings you in that award. You are interested, you are fascinated, it's almost three-dimensional, you, you care about it. You are invested personally. The other one is a kind of a memorization exercise with mm -hmm. names and dates that you have no, that have no relevance to your life and so what's the point? You know, it takes some really good teachers to make history come alive and either most of them are not or most of them are but they are kind of limited in what they can teach based on just kind of standard curriculum the way it's set up that sort of squashes what they could do with it so really the way we do history in grade school it's pretty bad yeah yeah my my brother is big into video games um much more than me and uh, so when you say assassin's creed i i do know a little bit of that and uh and it's interesting that people will look at those kind of video games of, of history, let's say, and they say, you know, that's violent, right? Because, sure. you know, it's worse than watching a movie and watching violence because you, and you're in the video game and you're committing the violence, right? So it's sure. worse, right? But then th then to me, that kind of presupposes the idea that that people are violent because because of video games or because right. of movies. It's like, wait a minute, don't you read history? Yeah. <laughs> you know? People who have done nasty things to each other for a really long time. <laughs> so it's not that you are not going to have violence. It's a right. matter of figuring out a healthy way to channel right. that aggressivity. So, you know, go work out, go train martial arts, go do something that, you know, you're in touch with that dimension, but you channel it in a healthy way. Because it's not going to not be there. You know, it's going to yeah. be there regardless. You just can either find a healthy way to express it or an unhealthy way to express it. But it's going to be there no matter what. Right, right, and uh, I mean, in all all different kinds of cultures, for all different kinds of reasons, there has been violence, right? For you know, mm -hmm. for religion, for you know, competing governments, for you know, territories, for resources, and uh, and, and people, you know, when they say uh, you know it's inherent in human nature, violence, you know, I, I, I tend to disagree, you know, it's, and I and I tend to believe that it's more a result of upbringing and 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 human conditioning rather than human nature, you know, how. How have you been raised? What kind of parents have you had? Have you had parents? What, did they abandon you? You know, sure. you know, were you left alone, right, to fend for yourself? So that I think that to me is more of an indicator of how an adult, you know, comes out. Yeah, I think it's um, it's one of those, you know, the nature versus nurture things are always tricky because it's always both. You know, it's never disordered. Yeah. Right. It's a matter of uh, how much of each, and that's where the argument is. Because obviously, you know, it's both sides. Both things exist. Of course, I right. bring it huge. Of course, there's some natural element that's huge, but which one is the bigger one? That's where it's tricky to figure out. To me, I'm interested, like you, more into the nurture part because you can do something about it. You know, the nature, there's nothing you can do about it. It's kind of, it's your DNA. It's who the cards you are given. So whereas if you put the emphasis on the nurture, you can emphasize more agency and what you can do about it to change it in more desirable ways. So that's kind of the way I look at it. But um, it's hard to tell because, yeah, I mean, when you look at the pervasiveness of violence in human society, it sure makes you think, you know. Right, right. And, uh, and, and before we get into your history, I just wanted to mention I, I listened to the, um, uh, the Dan Carlin episode he did on, uh, on Genghis Khan. Mm -hmm. um, the five episode one is fast, <laughs> excellent, fascinating. I'm sure all of his stuff is fascinating, but but like one thing that he he mentioned in there, which I'm sure he mentioned before, was the idea of the uh, the historical arsonist. You know, the uh, the um, that one character in history, you know, just lights a fire of of in a woods of decadent 
decadent, um, you know, organisms, like things that are dying and decaying. And it just sure. comes, this, this guy comes along and just lights a fire and allows for new growth. And, and it seems like a lot of people um, look at like, you know, like Genghis Khan or Alexander the Great or, you know, Caesar. And they say, you know, yeah, he killed a bunch of people, but we got trade. <laughs> right, right, there was right. trade. <laughs> and, yeah, it's tricky because, yeah, a lot of things, when you look at them in the great scheme of things, uh, there are benefits that come from it. But all the people who were involved in it at that time, they sure as hell didn't see any benefit at that <laughs> right. time. They only saw nasty, you know, thousands and thousands of people dying, horrible deaths. Right, right. So, yeah, that's the fact that you can say, hey, it actually turned out there was some nice silver lining at the end doesn't really make up for all the damage done at that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like... It's like um you know, like like he he gave the example of Hitler. You know, and and people say, well, what if what if Hitler actually won World War Two, and he over time maybe his his uh, descendants um, established the European Union in his way, you know, or his the Nazi Party way, and then people would be writing books about how Hitler's such a wonderful guy because he united Europe. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And 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 the more the better question rather than saying you know he's such a wonderful guy is well what about why don't you ask the relatives of the people that he murdered yeah, exactly <laughs> they might, no, right that's why that's why those things are impossible to evaluate in that fashion for sure right right so please um, go into a little bit um, the you know the episode on the history of fire uh, w- the um, the slave wars. Um, because that was really a, a fascinating. For, first, you you went into a little bit of a, about slavery and how I mean, basically every every society in the ancient world had slavery, and uh, but then you know the Roman Empire, which basically you know we're all taught you know if we, especially we're living in the American Empire, like empires are wonderful, right? You know, one rule of law, right? It's you know it's like you got you got one ruler and it's just wonderful, right? Um, but again, what about the people that are conquered and, and like you oh, said exactly. in the podcast, most of them become slaves. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's exactly how it is. You're absolutely right. So, yeah. So, so just get, can, can you go into a little bit about, about, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I know there's three of them and, and the most popular one is the, um, Spartacus, but like, I didn't know a lot. Like, I, you know, I knew a little bit, I guess, about Spartacus because my wife was interested in the, uh, you know, the HBO series Spartacus. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and although it's kind of bloody, but I guess it's, uh, it's kind of still pretty accurate, you know? I'm down. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. So, so just give me your, your impression of, of that whole time period. Like, uh, you know, is it, like, is it relevant? You think, do you see, do you see similarities between, let's say, the Roman Empire at that time and today? Sure. I mean, certain dynamics don't change. And when you look at human history, a lot of human history is a struggle for power. And whoever can get their hands on some kind of power, usually they do whatever they can to hold on to it and expand it at the expense of other people. And other people tend to get screwed over, and so they want to fight it back because they want to get it. And, you know, we tend to romanticize that the guys who got screwed over as the good guys they're not necessarily the good guys. They are the guys who are getting screwed over, yeah. which it's, uh, you know, if you flip the roles, doesn't mean that they are not going to do the same thing as often it happens in history. It's um, so a lot of the name of the game is crabs in a pot. You know, you see these guys trying to take each other down to get uh, to get what they want into it. So, I mean, yeah, when you look at history 2000 years ago in ancient Rome and the kind of games that the, uh, super elite played in order to hold on to as much wealth as humanly possible and then large even further uh, that's the same thing you see everywhere in big state societies you know you see it today you see it in china you know you see it all over the globe in all times in history where there has been large state society states huge social classes those dynamics don't really disappear and um, like I was reading right now, I was doing some research for a future episode. I was researching about Theodore Roosevelt and I was looking about the clash between Theodore Roosevelt and um, sort of the, he was pushing this antitrust legislation against corporate monopolies. Mm-hmm. And those things were identical to the dynamics of the Roman Empire, where you have Roosevelt who's kind of your uh, Gaius Gracchus of the time was saying, look, we need to reform things. Otherwise, it's going to be even worse. There's going to be a real revolution here. So I'm not doing it because I'm a radical. I'm trying to reform stuff to save the state from its abuses. 
And then you have the guys who are more radical than him, but then you have all the backlash of the guys who want to hold on to their money and it's like, what, I'm a billionaire? I need to be a multi-billionaire. What are you talking about? You're trying to strip me of my freedom by doing this. And so there's all this fight. The same dynamics that repeat themselves over and over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as Mark Twain had said, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right? And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that it's very important to illustrate that, you know, um, when you, you can study history and you can see patterns and we can sometimes apply those patterns to the present day. And so, yeah, so the, yeah, the Roman Empire, like, like it's funny that, um, you know, when you ask somebody like, you know, do you think the German people under Hitler um, had a right to revolt and rebel against their government? Right, mm. and because their government, their, their, their you know their government was tyrannical, and they're like, of course, yeah. Right. What about yeah. you know the people living under Joseph Stalin, right, and and, and all the mayhem and, and destruction he caused um, in forming the Soviet Union? Do you think they had a right to rebel? Of course. Well, what about the United States? <laughs> are we sure. not? Are we not an imperialistic empire? But they're like, no, 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 no. United States, it's different. <laughs> Right. No, I mean, and it's different by degrees, you know. Of course, yeah. it's uh, compared to Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Soviet Union. Yeah, the U.S. today is a breeze of freedom, but compared to actual what the ideal would be, it's really, really far from. You know, you're talking imperialism is imperialism, and you're right. talking about degrees, and of course. The fact that uh, it's one of the things, like whatever people argue, you almost have to argue the opposite. Because the guys who are all telling you, you know, US, freest country on earth is amazing. It's like, well, <laughs> also no. Let's look at this, this, and this, and this. And you go through the lines and there are horrific abuses of human rights and horrific things that have been done in US history and continue to be done. By the same token, then you got the guys who argue, oh, U.S., the most evil power there is, it's the same as the war thing. And it's like, well, there's so much worse. Uh, when you take it into account, not that bad. There are a lot of fairly good things. And yes, even the crap is not as crappy as in other places. So it's, and both things are real. Too quick to dismiss the horrific history, then you become an apologist for really nasty things. If you obsess about all the nasty things and you don't realize that there are degrees and that it's not the same thing as like the war things that we've seen in human history and it's then you're delusional the other way. So, you know, it's always a balancing game. It's kind of like, uh, that's why to me is like I'm not interested in making absolutist argument of one kind or another. Like typically when I see two factions clashing or whatever that may be, politics, uh, it, it, yeah, really about just about any topic I can think of. Usually, you never have one faction with one hundred percent right, mm -hmm. even if they are almost entirely right. There's always going to be like one little point that on the other side they are making, which is a good point. It doesn't make it fifty-fifty. It doesn't make it that they are exactly the same, but it does mean that usually reality is more complicated than any black and white worldview. You know, where uh, and politics or history is no different than anything else. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. There's a uh, there's a polarization that happens when uh, you know in, in government and uh, and you know when people people vying for power. You know that's that's not a new phenomenon. <laughs> you know, people yeah. people have an addiction to power. They say power is more addictive than than cocaine or heroin. And, uh, <laughs> and yep. I truly believe that. Like, like you know, um, you know, one of the, one of my favorite quotes of Charlie Chaplin is, uh, you know, the the best things you can do uh, can be done with love, and only the you know, if you want to do something evil, that's why you need power. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's tricky because again, even it's a tricky game. I mean, there's obviously a reason why people crave power because it allows you to do more. You know, to uh, whatever you can do, any kind of power, whether it's financial, whether it's of any other kind, gives you more muscle to get stuff done. But at the same, in the same way, it's so easy to get lost into that power chasing game where you start justifying kind of like the end justify the means, and uh, you forget the end goal. It becomes its own struggle. You become so consumed with acquiring power that then all of your effort revolves around acquiring power and you really forgo why you wanted to have power to begin with. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like Lord of the Rings, you know. You know, I can use the ring for good. I don't know. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's where it gets tricky, you know. It's like, yeah, yeah but no, you know. It's, yeah. Right, right. So, so please, uh, can you go into a little bit of, of how you got into Taoism 
and uh, and martial arts. I assume that's uh, there's you know relationship with those two. Sure, I mean Taoism just always made sense to me. Just reading about it and um, studying it, it was always one of the things that you know if you want to be Christian, you need to follow certain doctrines that are about what being Christian is about. You want to be Muslim, you need to follow certain doctrines that. Taoism instead seemed to be fairly free in the sense of it's not asking you to believe anything. It's telling you, just look out the window. This is how the world works. Mm-hmm. Whether If you recognize it, good for you. If you don't, it doesn't really matter because the world still works that way whether you get it or not. <laughs> so there's no effort really to convince you or to convert you or to, have, to take anything on faith. Mm-hmm. It's just this is the nature of the universe. This is how life works. You want that information, it helps you, go with it. You don't, whatever, it doesn't matter. So it's uh, it seemed very kind of self evident to me a lot of Taoist thing. It, it was something that was just uh, it seemed like sort of enlightened common sense. It did not seem like some doctrine of beliefs that I had to accept on faith or on any other level. And also be very flexible. You know, you can actually apply Taoism in a bunch of contexts. You can be. Um, belong to whatever religious denomination, belong to any kind of philosophical worldview, and you can use Taoist principles in your own life. It doesn't require you to kind of give up whatever it is that you believe or you're about in order to embrace these new sets of beliefs. It's not really a belief. It's uh, it's like saying, it's like studying gravity. You know, if you lift something over your head and you let go, it's going to fall on your head. <laughs> Believe in it or whether you don't, it's still just the way it works. So to me, there was a practicality to Taoism that I found attractive. Yeah, I, I studied, uh, I, I, I read the uh, Tao Te Ching uh, for the first time in uh, high school by accident. I found it in the library and um, and I think it was like in 11th grade or 12th grade and uh, fascinated me. I loved it. And, and, and I was always interested in holistic medicine, holistic nutrition. And sure. So I just uh, from there I just decided, you know, Chinese medicine, you know, acupuncture and Chinese herbs, and and all of that is based on Taoism heavily. Uh, so it really fell into place with me, and mm-hmm. uh, and like you said, you know, it's a very tiny book. I don't know, like I don't know, seventy, eighty pages, but uh, you know, it's, it's almost like almost like poetry, but with profound. Uh, you know, profound um, statements and principles, and uh, and like you said, self-evident. Like it's just, <laughs> yeah. Like to say to say such truths in the, in the smallest amount of words is uh, is uh, is real feat to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and it's brilliant. And depending on which translations you read, you know, it makes a very different effect. You know, some parts are uh, some translations are terrible and you read it and you're like, what is this crap? And other translations are brilliant and you they help you get it in a mm-hmm. fair easy way. So so that um, it's tricky. There are, you know, the Tao Te Ching is so quick to read. You can read it in two hours and be done, but at the same time you can spend a lifetime studying it because there are so many degrees and so much nuance to it. It's interesting. Yeah, I um you know, a couple of the principles, uh, the Taoist principles that I really took to heart were, um, yield, well, one of them is yielding, you mm-hmm. know, the idea that, you know, a, a, a small sapling is powerful, is has strength because it can yield to the, you know, to the, to the wind, to the, to the strongest sure. gale, whereas yeah. the mightiest tree that's dry and old cannot and will break. And so the idea of strength it's not a it's not a matter of brute force, but it's a matter of um, you know what can you tolerate, right? What what um, what can you absorb and then and then divert you know away from you so that it doesn't harm you. And I thought that's a powerful principle that you know you could apply to martial arts, but also in in just talking with people or relationships or you know um, and, and and how you just uh, you know you just got to be easy, you know. The, and also another idea that I really loved is the idea of of water overpowering. Uh, stone, right? N- not through sure. brute force again, but just through gently falling over many, many years can wear away the strongest stone. So, Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing that's interesting that the Tao Te Ching with the idea of emphasizing both the yin and the yang, they say, well, the, the yang, we don't need to emphasize it because everybody understands strength. Everybody understands effort. Right. Everybody understands that kind of vibe. So 
while yes it is important no we don't really need to talk about it because it's self-evident it's obvious everybody gets it already mm -hmm. in on the other end the yielding aspect the more flexible aspect the less obvious aspect is one that does need to emphasize because people don't get it so it's not to say that yang doesn't is not important but is not it doesn't you don't need to read anything to understand that level mm. whereas the yin does require research because it's more subtle it's less uh, it's, for our monkey brains it's not as easy <laughs> to grasp right away so you need to figure out you know it's easy for me okay i punch that guy out i win i stand on top <laughs> get what i want out of it <laughs> right you know, it's caveman like, it works, but it doesn't need, you don't need to study for it to get it. Whereas to figure out how to get the same job done in a way that doesn't require the outward use of force, that requires more strategy. So that's why to me, many people tend to get infatuated with Taoism and they emphasize only the yin. Mm. It's all about, and it's, that's not the way it works in reality. You know, in reality, you need a boat and mm. you need to be able when to apply each. You know, if you look at uh, judo, the martial art of judo was um, Jigoro Kano kind of uh, reframed the whole jujitsu curriculum he had studied in order to make it fit with Taoist principles. So he got rid of all of the techniques that require too much strength. He got rid of all of, he was very much on all of judo should be a reflection of Taoist principles. And yet, when you look at judo contest, you see this guy sweating and grunting and using muscle. You know, it's not this uh, sort of the image that people have of Tai Chi of just you barely move and the other guy is flying away. <laughs> but the key there is not that. Is, is it a contradiction? It's not, actually. It's just what Kano and the, Tao, and the Tao Te Ching tell you is use as little strength as needed to get the job done. As little strength may still mean a hell of a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. You're just trying not to overdo it. Not to, you know, by using technique, you can make up for a lot of strength. You can make up for all of strength, but you can make up for some. And so to me, it's important to understand those dynamics because you do need both. But obviously, the yin aspect is, uh, the yin aspect also tend to be, whereas a strength is going to decline with age, strategy doesn't strategy lasts a lot longer your ability to manipulate the game in a way that requires less strength is something that you can carry with you for much longer in life than you can require than you can carry your physical attributes at your absolute best yeah <clears throat> yeah i studied karate for uh, about eight years when i was uh uh like a teenager <clears throat> not necessarily because I wanted to. <laughs> Something my parents, uh, my, especially my father, wanted uh, me and my uh, my siblings to do, and I did not enjoy it. Um, <laughs> not much. I, I I went into a brown belt, three stripes, and then I quit because I didn't want to want to get my black belt. Um, right. But then afterwards, I I went to college and I learned uh, Tai Chi and Qigong, and um, and that really fascinated me. It really did because um, you know, like you said, everybody understands the strong. Uh, mm -hmm. aspect of uh, of fighting but not many people um can, can appreciate the uh you know, you know the yin or the yielding or the uh you know the absorbing or the importance of having a strong stance you yep. know and, and having a strong root and things like that so <clears throat> that's what fascinated me about that absolutely absolutely and um i think um that's what makes it interesting the beauty of martial arts is that there's a live practice so you know we can theorize from here to forever but ultimately it's what works and what doesn't and you discover it by by doing it by practicing definitely definitely so uh please can you go into your uh, your recent book uh, not afraid and just my listeners know um uh, what it's about and uh, why you wrote it it's really based just on life experience. I was thinking of writing a more philosophical book, but then I realized that any time I discuss things in more philosophical ways, people may be interested, but they only go so far. When I talk about personal life, the level of interest and the level of how people are able to relate to it tend to go sky high really quick. So it made a lot more sense to me to, rather than presenting this appearance of philosophical objectivity and talk about great principles, is to bring it back to a very raw, personal element of the story. So in this regard, the book is divided roughly in three parts. The first part is about my experience of fear in the martial arts, um, fighting, dealing with that aspect when my personality was not naturally inclined to that. I was much more sort of yin, mellow, happy 
Uh, I didn't, and so to me, it was interesting to sort of step into an arena that's anything but that, where it's all about kind of adrenaline, competition, toughness, and all of that. And then, in some way, uh, the stuff that I learn in that context, how they carry out to the rest of life, to the stuff that's actually really important, because ultimately what you do in the ring or on the mat is only it's only so important. The big stuff is what you can take from that to the rest of life. And so in my case, I talk about sort of the whole experience of what happens with my wife, who eventually will, um, in 2010, uh, she got um, a brain tumor and then died in early 2011. And then to life afterwards, you know, when you realize that no matter how safe you play it, you can never play it safe enough because nobody's fully safe. Bad things can and do happen to everyone. So that realization, the realization that ultimately all the things that I'm afraid of, yeah, they will come through. And there's really not a whole lot I can do about avoiding them. So how does that help me sort of reframe my outlook on life? How does that... Because at that point, I mean, on one end it's terrifying. On the other end, there's the freeing aspect of it that is like, well then I don't really need to be afraid because if fear is not really protecting me from something, then what's the point of being afraid to begin with? You know, it's um, enjoy the ride while it lasts, play it while you can have fun with the understanding that really nothing you can do, you know, as the Jim Morrison biography, no one here gets out alive, you know, mm-hmm. there's no way to play it safe enough to go truly what you want. Right. So those are kind of the dynamics of the book. Of what I'm playing with, yeah, the idea of fear, um, it, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a great topic to talk about because fear can truly be paralyzing uh, in so many ways. You know, can prevent yep. you from trying, you know, new adventures. Can can just prevent you from doing things like like even if you have a, a an unjustified fear of something like flying or you know public speaking, you know, <clears throat> and uh, and it, and it's quite sad that 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 um, that fear is present. So like. Um, like one thing that I did, I don't know if I don't know if you also did, but I did stand up comedy uh, mm-hmm. a few years ago, and um, it was a great experience. Um, I did it with my brother. My brother was nineteen. We took a stand up comedy class, and uh, and then we just um, performing in uh, stand up and comedy clubs in in Long Island and in Manhattan, and um, it's just an amazing experience. You meet amazing people. You just it, it's really a soul. Um, exposing, I think, <laughs> because you're going up there, no props, just you yep. and a microphone. <laughs> That's yep. it. Uh, have you ever have you ever tried anything like that? No, I mean I do public speaking for a living, so I've been ah, right, 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 forever. So it's not, it doesn't quite have the same degree of pressure because you don't have that twenty second. You need to make people laugh every twenty <laughs> second kind of thing. Right. It is. Uh, some people find it unnerving. Some people are really stressed out by the idea of having all these people looking at you and listening to what you have to say. Mm-hmm. But um, public speaking was never one that... It's funny how fear works. You know, there are certain things that terrorize somebody else and they may not bother you at all. And then there's something else that somebody's totally natural at and they scares the hell out of you, you know? it's uh, So to me, public speaking was mildly scary at first and then I kind of got over it fairly quick. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, would, yeah, you're right. I think it, it is different from what you do. Um, and uh, I remember a poll that was taken a couple of years ago, which which asked people, uh, you know, what are you most afraid of? And the mm-hmm. number one thing uh, is public speaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. And th- number two is death. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty funny. That's yeah. I, uh, no, number yeah, public speaking doesn't bother me, but a lot of other things do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and the reason that my brother did it um, was because he's a socially, you know, um, you know, I guess an introvert. You know, he wanted to improve sure. his his social his conversational skills, ha- how he talks to people. And so, you know, what better way to do that than to force yourself in front of complete strangers? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> for know? sure, for sure. No, and I think that's something healthy about because uh, you know you can avoid all the things that are scary in life. But the reality is that you can't really fully avoid them. You can partially avoid them. You can delude yourself that you can avoid them. But the reality is that eventually life is going to force you in some really uncomfortable place one way or another. And if you are not 
used to being uncomfortable, then you're really going to be screwed at that point because then you're going to still be trying to run at a time when life is not letting you run, where you are stuck, where there is no way out, you know. And uh, in some way, like that idea of learning how to deal with fear, learning how to deal with being uncomfortable, learning all that, that's what applies to the rest of life. That's why to me in that sense, that's where martial arts can transcend, can be not just about martial art, but it can be about life itself in that regard. Because, uh, I mean, to, the most interesting things in martial arts are the ones that is not the flashy techniques, is not the winning per se. In some way, the least glamorous aspects are the most interesting. The ones where you get learning how to get your ass kicked, learning how to fight on, even when you really have no realistic chance of winning, that stuff translates to the rest of life, you know, because it's not about technique, it's about toughness, it's about resiliency, it's about being able to stay with it, even when you really, there's no rational light at the end of the tunnel, there's no rational reason to think that things are going to work out at the end. So that, to me, is where it's more... Uh, it's relevant to everything. That's something that you can learn in a boxing ring or a martial art class and you bring to just everything else in life. Yeah, yeah. And and, and it kind of reminds me of, um, <clears throat> you know, my podcast and my, my website, peacefulanarchism.com, uh, which, um, you know, I originally started to just write articles and uh, and I never really imagined starting a YouTube channel, but eventually I did. And mm -hmm. um, And, you know, it's really because... I was reading and learning about all of the um, horrifying things that our government, <clears throat> United States government, has done and is doing um, mm -hmm. to uh, you know to its own citizens and, and and those of other countries as well, and uh, and so I I felt I felt uh, obligated my to speak out and to just say my opinion of this stuff, and and the fear was not, um, I, you know, initially I didn't have fear. Like uh, when I started the podcast, maybe before I started learning about it, you, I kind of felt a little fearful. You're like, well, you know, the NSA is fine. They can read everything, you know, your text, your email, and everything. But the thing is, like, if you choose to be quiet, if you choose to um, self-censor, mm -hmm. I think you already have admitted defeat. You have already claimed or you have already um, – decided that they control you and what you say and what you write and so <clears throat> there's there's just <laughs> there's just no more i mean i mean to 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 admit defeat in that which basically to me is like an, a spiritual defeat you know you you say i can't say this because somebody might be listening somebody might be watching sure. that's a horrible horrible uh place to be <laughs> absolutely and on that note one of the most classic ones that just about everybody would relate to is the fact that, you know, we all want to be liked. We all want people to respond a certain way to us. It feels good and it helps us get things we want. So it naturally, people tend to want to always put themselves in the best possible light, always appear in the way that's most likely to get a positive reaction from other people. So that fear of how other people are going to perceive you, that fear of how other people are going to judge you, is a huge one that most people have to one degree or another. But at the same time, that's a really bad fear to fall prey to because what happens is that then you start changing who you are in order to get a reaction. You behave uh, differently from what you really want to be because of how... And then it's impossible to keep it up because you're not really going to spend your whole life keeping this mask on. So you're just going to do it for as long as possible to get what you want, and then eventually the way you really are is going to transpire. And so you're really not fooling anyone, but at the same time you're also putting yourself under this tremendous strain to pretend you're somebody that you're not. And that doesn't really work at all. It's kind of like if you go on a date and you try to appear something other than who you are, mm. Uh, is great maybe if you just start trying to get laid quickly but other than that if you're actually thinking about seeing this person multiple times right why would you do that then you have to be that guy every the rest of your life if, if the other person like that guy that's who you have to be screw that i don't want to be that guy um <laughs> so it's 
those are the way those fears can uh, limit us, can turn us into something other than we can and want to be. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of a uh, of, of a this meme I saw, which says, uh, "I used to go into a room and and wonder if people like me, but now I go into a room and wonder if I like." The people. <laughs> in the yeah, room. It's, it's so relaxing when you like yourself. You can enjoy who you are, and it doesn't mean you don't ch- make changes. You know, you do it, probably will see things you don't like so much about yourself, and then you work and you try to. But that's because you want to work on it, it's not because you're doing it to please somebody else. Right. And uh, otherwise, it's so painful and heavy to try to act according to somebody else's script. Mm-hmm. There's something incredibly freeing when you are at home in your own skin and you feel like, hey, this is who I am. And I'm not going to make 3,000 compromises to pretend I'm somebody else. You know, if you like me, you like me. Mm-hmm. If you don't like me, you don't like me. Either one is fine, but let's not play games with each other. You know, mm-hmm. let's just be real here. Um, it feels really damn good. <laughs> and oddly enough, by the way, people tend to respond to it 10 times better. Because when people are not thinking that they don't get that feeling that you're trying to sell them something where you're just being with complete radical honesty, that's how you live your life, people tend to respect you a little better. And if they don't, it's probably a good thing because then you don't waste time with each other on, uh, um, you know, it's like, you know, this is why I am, you don't like me. Maybe they're okay. I understand why you understand why. Great. You go on with your life. I do my thing. Everybody wins. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and my wife, um, as I was, you know, writing my articles and doing these videos and, and interviews, um, you know, my wife would be, um, cause she, my wife grew up in communist Romania, um, mm-hmm. and she left there in, um, 1994, um, so a couple of years after communism fell, and so she experienced that, and so, and she experienced like the police, or, or I don't know what they would call over there, but you know the enforcement class, and how how easily they could take somebody away, you know, sure. for saying anything um, against you know the ruling institutions, and and so she was fearful of that, and so her idea of living. Of, of, of life, you know, her philosophy when, when she talks about what I do, she's like, the people who survive in history are the people who run away, the people who hide, the people sure. who, um, you know, uh, you know uh, don't fight back, basically. And so, and so she was, t- you know, she always cautions me, like, maybe you're saying, maybe you're going too extreme, maybe you're too eccentric, maybe you're saying too much. And, uh, and then I think about it, and I'm like, well, if I do run away, and I do self-censor, and, you know, not talk about this stuff, what kind of a message is that sending to my kids? Sure. Do I want to raise them to be like that, to be, to cower in the corner, in the shadows, when people, you know, try to dominate and subjugate them? Is that sure. the kind of child I want to raise, right? Even because, I mean, it's not that you live forever. It's no. like you put yourself uh, a little bit more. There's no surviving in history that way. You're still going to die the same way as the other guy. You just right. die later. Right, right, right. Yeah, you, you never uh, Yeah, you never get out of it. You never get out of life alive, something like that. Yeah. Right? That's the core. <laughs> And uh, and so yeah, it's it's so true that um, you know I think it's it's so important, and, and this is what the internet has done a, a wonderful job of, of giving er, you know so many more people a voice, right? Like you know anybody can start a podcast, anybody can start a YouTube channel, anybody can start a blog, and it's just so easy right now. You know the cost of doing such things is so low as compared to you know before the internet, right? It, where, 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 where you had to write a book, you had to write a pamphlet, you had to you know it's just time consuming you know and you yep. you make a podcast how many people are going to see it all over the world it's, it's just no absolutely it's, it's magnificent so um so yeah so i see i see a wonderful um you know a wonderful future um because of the internet i think it, it has decentralized all of this information that uh that before like i remember um i, I just i also listened to the dan carlin one about um Mar- martin luther and the 95 oh, yeah. theses and then the the anabaptists and in Munster, yep. and and how how revolutionary was Gutenberg's printing press, right? I think it was in, yep. the, in the 1400s, and and it's basically comparable to the internet of today, you know, and how it has has um, freed the people of yep. uh, you know the 
you know how they you know how the priest class can control the, the peasants because they didn't know how to read latin right yep absolutely no that's uh, in fact the technological innovations certainly make certain processes way easier than ever before um, you could, you know, there are spaces for freedom in certain environments, but then, of course, certain technological innovations make it simpler, just like that. And that's clearly not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's amazing, like, uh, you know, even at that time, you know, just, just with the Gutenberg printing press, how threatened the church was by um, the, the, the free flow of information and and the fact that they can print in their own language rather than in Latin, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, in, in this uh, you know really uh, eclectic language that very few people understood, and and how much that scared the ruling institutions of the time, and they really considered it like 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 intellectual contagions, like that's infecting right. the masses. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's true. No, and it's uh, funny because there's always that desire to kind of squash it and keep it uh, under wraps, and you can't. You know, those innovations usually uh, are too powerful for any one regime to control. Yeah, and I see I see echoes of that in in today with the internet and with net neutrality and with um, mm-hmm. and within China. You know, there's a, you know, a good yeah. amount of internet censorship, and then sure. in, in I think Great Britain as well. And <laughs> and, and I think uh, John Kerry, one of my one of my favorite quotes of John Kerry is, uh, "Is the internet is making it much harder to govern." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's pretty funny. So yeah, it's it's. Um, I have a lot of hope for the future. I think you know we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg of of the potential of what of what you know this this um you know global communication has to offer. Like like mm-hmm. I mean just just like communication technology like like phones. I mean cell phones and. You know, like Skype, like we're doing, like how sure. how, how how difficult was it? Before, you know, just a short while ago to make a long distance phone call, how expensive it was. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, and so I really, uh, I'm very excited um, at what's happening, and I think my children. I, I'm very hopeful for the future. A lot of people are not hopeful. A lot of people are are fearful. You know, mm-hmm. like like of the draft, or you know what has what's going to happen, World War Three, and all these nuclear powers coming. And you know all these all these insane leaders are threatening each other with nuclear um, nuclear bombs, but I don't see it that way. You know, I see I see a much brighter future. I see I see more and more people are um, educating themselves and not not in government schools. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. And it's I think it really is one of those uh, glass half empty, glass half full kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So you can really feel however you want because there are obviously some. Excellent things that are happening that makes you feel hopeful about the future. There are a lot of horrible things that are happening that are making you not feel so hopeful about the future. So at that point, it really boils down to you are the kind of guy who's more glass of full or glass of empty. There's just no because um, you have probably good reasons to feel either way, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so let me ask you another another question. I asked uh, Prof. CJ um, since you're uh, also very um, you know history. Um, in, uh, you know, avid uh, person in, in history. Um, so, what when you if you encounter somebody that says, um, "Okay, okay, Daniele, so I know you're interested in history. You have this history podcast, but that's thousands of years ago. That's how can that possibly help me to know about this stuff? It happened already. It's done. So, why do I need to learn about this? What relevance will that have in my life?" What would you I say to a person? That, I think the best thing that you can get from history is that it teaches you a lot about human nature and how humans operate you know just by virtue of being one person you can only have so much experience in your life mm. studying history is like being able to tap into the experiences of lots of other human beings so if it's true that we learn from our own experience how much easier it is to be able to not have to go through every single thing but to learn from somebody else's experience so you don't have to make all the same stupid mistakes to achieve the same conclusion you know to get the same insight Mm-hmm. So in that regards, I see history as a as a lab that allows you to experiment with what it means to be human, you know, and you can look at all the other experiments other people have done to see which way it works. You know, what um, I think really that boils down to the most important thing you can get out of it. Okay, very good answer. And and also another, another question I frequently get asked is um, when I talk about history is, um, I think my wife has said this many times, um, <clears throat> is... How do you know what you're saying is true? 
right? Like, like you know, I, I say, well, government history class, that's lies. But this is true. Well, how do you know? How do you know? You weren't there. You didn't see it. You know, even even the, the books that you're dealing with, that's, you know, um, you know, I guess you're, you're the third person, you know. So, so how do you know? What's your... Uh, security that you're what you're saying is is closer to what actually happened a lot of times you don't a lot of times you don't know whether that's the absolute truth that it happened and so that's the reality that you know just about most stories there's like this is what these guys say happened but then these other guys argue this other thing okay let's look at the evidence these guys seem to have some solid evidence these guys don't or in some cases is uh, the evidence is messy it's kind of hard to figure it out and so what you do is you honestly just report to the various versions and who knows which one is the real one you know so a lot of times you know a lot of history we act like we know more than we do mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the times we don't mm -hmm. you know we have uh, which doesn't mean you don't know anything you know something but to piece it together in a fully cohesive story is a more complicated kind of game and uh, and that's where you got to be honest and just admit what it is that you know for a fact because there were like 15 different testimony of contemporary people who were there at the time versus what it is that you know maybe hopefully kind of who knows because you have somebody who live for years later who was somebody else who was told who was there you know so it's like that is that solid history that one not so much does that mean that it didn't happen maybe it did but hard to tell how to know for sure you know so in that regard it's not that it's all equally hopeless to find out the truth some cases are solid some cases are solid in the negative in the sense that it's obvious that it didn't happen and most others there's a gray zone yeah, that's uh, that's a good point, and also I, I like to uh, I, I like the idea that um, you know the idea of treason and revolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, first of all, revolution. Um, well, well, treason. Let's say you know is is tend to be seen in a negative light, right? But but if if the the the, the group of people that that commit treason are successful, then it goes down in history not as treason but as sure. a successful you know um overthrow or revolution right so so sure. because so 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 the idea of that the governments of today were all basically treasonous to <laughs> the governments of antiquity right yep. i think that's important to learn that history is always written by the victors and that you rarely hear history from the other side which is why i love the book um uh howard zinn's uh, people history of the united states i i, I read that sure. A little while ago and uh you know it's and it's great you know you hear from the perspective of the native american from the blacks from the women you know from the irish from from uh the chinese from all these groups that that is just not given in the standard history uh class right oh, absolutely and that's why it's tricky because you get uh that's why you know for uh, dan carlin or even for what i do for research in a podcast you can read one book on a topic and you're done right right because the odds that that book contains the entire story are next to none right whether because of a bias whether because they focus on some aspect not others whether because they chose some quotes and not others you know you have to look at any one historical event from 10 15 different viewpoints um, you know, that's where it's at. You really can't, uh, you really, really can't uh, do it on a, hoping that the first book you read is the one that nails it. You know, it's like you need to read all these different points of views and then trying to reconcile them in a narrative that makes sense to you based on what you've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's why I have, uh, you know, immense respect for what you do and what Dan Carlin does and Prof. CJ because I know, I know an enormous amount of research and investigation goes into each episode and um and it's not an easy task like uh you know deciphering or or going through and and disentangling the web of history and all lies and truth and everything yep. in between and <laughs> Yeah, I got like I probably one episode it's probably about 200 hours worth of research at least on average. Sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. But yeah, like right now I'm researching Theodore Roosevelt and I feel like I already know the story by now so well because I've gone through so many. But then each documentary I check out, each other book I read, there's more to it and then more and then more. So that's where it gets dangerous because that you can end up in Dan Carlin syndrome where you think that you will never <laughs> know enough. 
<laughs> and so you keep researching forever and you never release an episode again kind of thing, <laughs> which right. is, uh, you know, clearly... And I understand why, you know, it's because you feel that you could always use more knowledge. Mm. At the same time, you also want to get stuff done eventually. So at some point, you have to call it quits and say, okay, I've gone deep enough in this rabbit hole. I didn't find the end, but it's deep enough. And so it's a delicate balance to find uh, between those two, you know, between doing enough research and doing too much research. Yeah, and what really uh, what really impressed me with Dan Carlin was after I finished hearing the uh, Prophets of Doom about Martin Luther in the 95 Thesis, he said that, um, it, and it was like four and a half hours long, <laughs> it's yep. amazingly long, and, and he said, I just want everyone to know that I already did um, an episode of this in the same length. And I deleted the whole thing, which I rarely do, <laughs> because because I was dissatisfied with the result. And he's like, it's kind of like a painter, you know, does a painting that takes months, and you want to <laughs> get the perfect detail, and then finally you're like, nah, I don't like it, <laughs> and you scrap it, you throw it in the garbage. <laughs> wow, I mean, that really illustrated to me the amount of, um, you know, perfection that he was striving for. And uh, it's it's really um, it's an admirable trait, you know, being a perfectionist. But, and I guess it could be like self-destructive, but it's still admirable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's tricky. It's uh, it's tricky business for sure. I tell you that. Yeah. So, um, oh yeah. So, so um, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, um, so, please, before we go, can you um, just let my listeners know? Uh, repeat again your um, your links, how they can reach you if they want to follow your work. So the easiest one would be Twitter. Is my First initial, so the letter D, and then my last name, Bolelli, B-O-L-E-L-L-I. Uh, my name is my website, daniellebolelli.com, so it's like Daniel with one E at the end, and then Bolelli, B-O-L-E-L-L-I. Uh, History on Fire podcast, you just type it in iTunes, it pops up. The other one I do is called The Drunken Taoist. Uh, that also will pop up if you look for it in iTunes or however you get your podcasts. Those are probably the easiest thing. Yeah, I have a public Facebook page, you know, all of that good stuff. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, and I really encourage everyone to check out his content because um, I was blown away. And uh, as well as, you know, Prof. CJ and Dan Carlin, I, I, I regard all of you as really being the top echelon of uh, of, of history um, of history podcast. And it's really, a, it's really a, a refreshing to hear things, hear history in an engaging and riveting way because it's, I think it's hard to do that and you guys pull it off, you know, excellently. <laughs> and so... Yeah, I enjoy both of those guys. I, I listen to Dan Carlin, I listen to Prof. CJ. Both of them are great podcasts. They do excellent work. They are completely different from each other, but they are both good quality. Right, uh, right very informative entertaining so i dig them yeah 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 definitely i mean i mean i i know how hard it is to come to you know to come up with good content um and engaging content and i really uh give you guys a lot of respect for that so thank you for very very much for uh for doing that and for coming on the show so if anyone wants to help out my show um you can do so through paypal through bitcoin or patreon the links are below uh my patreon page is patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism uh to help out the show and please do help me out because i love having wonderful guests like uh daniele bellelli here and i want to do more of it and uh monetary um encourage it, it, monetary compensation is always encouraged um you know the uh <clears throat> the, the, the only democracy i support is um voting with your dollar right you know if you want to see something more more of in the world you uh you pay for it value for value right so if you find value in this um in this content please please donate to us. So thank you very much, Daniele, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. So this is uh, Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>